All right, ladies and gentlemen, citizens of the Empire, we are doing a review of the first two Kenobi episodes that dropped last night, and I assume midnight. I'm not actually too sure because I, I just sort of encountered it when I was setting up for today, but this is going to be in the same format we did with the Kenobi, ep uh, not Kenobi, <laughs> the uh, Clone Wars Season 7 episodes. We're going to do a, a little synopsis of the episode, get on to what I think about it, and it's going to be full of spoilers, so if you haven't watched it yet, of course, go watch Kenobi first. Come on back. You're good. So we're going to start with episode one, which opens on Order 66, giving us a little bit of a new perspective, and I think sort of priming people who are still somehow unaware about what the show's going to be about, mostly. Uh, we see a group of younglings, look like about six of them, with an instructor training on a balcony, and Order 66 pops off. The children get away, their instructor doesn't, and neither does a lot of people, as it's shown. Uh, we don't get any new perspective on what maybe Grogu went through, so it, it's, it's just, it's almost just a self-contained little clip. Um, and then we jump straight to Tatooine where 10 years later the Grand Inquisitor and two other Inquisitors who we later find out are the find out are the third sister and fifth brother are landing just square in the middle of town because they can <laughs> they, they don't have to go any any landing area. no they didn't just land in the middle of town and it's great um, however, I, I, I do want to note a little bit that I heard, I haven't looked too much into the situation that the Grand Inquisitor actor kind of refused to look into his character in Rebels, which that kind of pisses me off. I, I, I can see why he might do that, because you'll see in the episodes that he's not in it much in too much but you know still it's a little troubling um the uh the inquisitor armor though i think is a marked improvement it looks kind of different from rebels for uh, i checked checked some of it out and compared the two looks different i think it's an improvement but you know we we can all have our feelings and debates on that um Let's see, the new Inquisitor the, is the third sister, uh, who is very, very openly shown to have an obsession with finding Obi-Wan, so it, it's not, finding him is not the reason they're on Tatooine, they're actually there for another Jedi, who is eventually found in, uh, in the, uh, in a bar, one of the many bars of Moss Eisley. Uh, but we come away from that to find Obi-Wan has found himself a job at some sort of meat packing place in the middle of the Dune Sea. I don't know <laughs> why you would have a meat packing place in the middle of the desert, but whatever, it's where he works. It, it seem, We see him at the end of his shift and we see him leave work, go into town, excuse me, <laughs> and then make his way home on his, on Eopi, which he still has from when, from the end of, uh, episode three, even though it's 10 years later, so that's good to see, uh, and he finds himself, once home, confronted by a Jawa, who he seems to regularly, uh, talk to for things like parts and supplies and stuff, but their, their back and forth is real funny. <laughs> and he try, it, And he's just, he, he's just confounded with this Jawa who he regularly sees. And you know how Jawas are. They're, they're insane. They're insane little creatures. And uh, it, it, was, it was great. Um, but from that Jawa, he buys some parts and gets... The toy T one fifty, I believe it's a T one fifty, that Luke eventually 
plays with all the time as a child, and we see in the Lars Homestead in episode one or episode four. So that's fuck, just callbacks. Um, and that night, Obi Wan just you know has some a lot a lot of nightmares. A lot of nightmares, mostly focusing on memories of Anakin and Padme, some of them on the Jedi, and he's still traumatized by it all ten years later, and it makes sense, because his brother and friend, whom he trained, is gone. And at this point, while Obi-Wan is not entirely sure Anakin is alive, he just sort of assumes that he is is uh, is dead because you don't really leave too many to burn alive on the shore banks of a lava river and have them survive um and they do and during this nightmare sequence they cut in like uh, footage from the prequels and it's very very good it's well done uh let's see and come the next day he goes to check on Luke from afar and we see the ori- the original, not the original Owen Ber- and Beru Lars, but from the prequels, the Owen and Beru Lars, which is a nice touch. They actually got a lot of the prequels actors come back, thankfully. They're all still relatively how they would look, and they're just a little bit older and grizzled, so it just, it, it all kind of, it's all come together. <laughs> um... So yeah, that was a lovely touch. Uh, at night, Obi Wan then physically goes to Lars Homestead, leaves the T one fifty as a gift for Luke, and encounters a man named Nari who followed him from town and has been hiding to watch him and later confront him, and who was another Jedi. From his age, he kind of looks like he would either be a youngling or like a young, a younger Padawan when all Order sixty six popped off. So it it, it kind of makes sense why when he see, finds Obi Wan, he confronts him a little bit like, "Dude, what's going on? What happened? Why are you not fighting the Empire?" And Obi Wan immediately just tells him, "Yeah, like yeah, the fight's done. Go bury your lightsaber somewhere in the middle of the desert." stay hidden, leave me alone, and just fucks off back to, back to his cave. Which, you know, it's a little, it's a little jarring to hear something like that out of Obi-Wan. And it really is. Ewan McGregor just jumps right back into it like nothing ever changed. <laughs> like, it hasn't been ten years, or over ten years, actually. Yeah, because it can't, uh, I think the last prequel movie came out in 2005, right? So yeah, it's it's been a minute. And so he just like leaves Nari there to go home. Immediately after that, we jump to Alderaan to see a very young Leia, about the age of 10, uh, being dressed for an event, but that's not Leia. Leia's got a wild spirit, so she convinced, I assume, one of her hand, hand, uh, hand servants to, you know, trade places with her so she can go run out in the forest and have have some fun climbing trees, throwing rocks at shit, and it, it, little kid stuff, which it, it's, it's good to see <laughs> that she's kind of always been a little bit wild. Um, I couldn't tell the species of the little girl, so I'm... We're just gonna call her an alien. Um, her um, her adoptive mom. I'm blanking on her name. Uh, then goes out to find her with a couple of guards. Takes her back, and it's revealed. Ooh, spooky mystery! Somebody is watching them. Which that's later to be revealed. Uh, back on Tatooine, Obi Wan goes through his whole work routine again. Uh, from the from the meatpacking place to town to back home, uh, but before he actually gets to go home, Owen can Owen Lars confronts him in town, like right near his a stable where he keeps Eopi before going home, and he 
tells him straight up to just stay away. He doesn't want him ending up like Anakin. But a little tension comes in because that's when the third sister and fifth brother arrive to do more interrogations of the town. And Obi-Wan has to hide immediately. He, he He's fine. Nothing pops off for him. But it, I think the scene serves to show off some brutality from the Inquisitors. Because Reva, the third sister, who now has a name, uh, very candidly says, I'm going to start cutting off hands until somebody tells me where the Jedi is. And when one of the citizens tries to mouth off, because technically it's hut space and the Empire has no jurisdiction out there, uh, she, she does what she said. She cut off her fucking hand. And it's... It's a little bit... I don't want to call it strange, because they made a point of cutting... Like, cutting off limbs in this scene, showing the burn marks and all that, but during the Order 66 clip... It seemed like all the clone armor was impervious to lightsabers, which if you know anything about Star Wars, that's not how it goes. They still died, but like there were no burn marks or scorch marks and no severed limbs or anything. So I don't know if that was a style choice or an oversight or just for some reason Disney didn't want a decapitated clone as the first thing we all see. I don't know. Um. So where were... Okay. And then she uh, confronts Owen, threatening his life, because Owen is acting a little bit suspicious. Of course he is, because he just spoke to a Jedi, whom he thinks they're there for, but he's he's not, that's actually not who he's there, for, who they're there for, as we know. Um, threatens his life, says she'll go to the Lars homestead, kill everyone there, so threatens Luke and Baru's life. But he doesn't give him up. And the fifth brother, the other Inquisitor who's with her, kind of forces her to stand down. So there, there's some clear indications of tension. And it, it, it's good because in Rebels, they sort of portrayed the Inquisitors as just these... I don't want to... I don't want to say terrible but like these kind of threatening but bumbling hunters who didn't really have any ambitions or want like they, they're doing this to you know be alive and maybe feed some sadism <laughs> but this shows that like the inquisitors were were actually sort of adapting to the sith philosophy while some aren't because the Sith philosophy, in in all actuality, is power, domination, and getting ahead. And Reva seems to be very intent on doing that in any way possible. So that's it, it's great to see. Um, after that, we return to Alderaan. We see Bale's actor again. I am I am blanking on his name. Um. But but he 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 also he played Am Amy Santiago's fa father in Brooklyn Nine Nine. If you don't know who he is, uh, um, let's see. And and they uh, they are Bale's rank is the same, so he's a senator, which further confuses why Leia is called a princess because. At, at this point, that means they're not a part of the Alderanian royal family, which I always thought, you know, changed over time because they, they do elect their kings sort of like Naboo did. They're, they're monarch. So I, I don't know. Maybe they're a part of the royal family, but, you know, just not with the crown. I don't know. <laughs> I thought they'd clear that up, but maybe not, I guess. Um, and we see him as they're receiving some family guests for a party. At the party, we, uh, see C-3PO for a, a little bit. He's just kind of being himself. 
<laughs> it's it's briefly. It's only like a couple of seconds. Um, and then we see even at the age of ten, per, uh, Leia's very perceptive, sassy, uh, who, and she can like deconstruct the flaws of her older bully of a cousin, just out of nowhere because he's a dick and she was treating him like he was being a dick. <laughs> Um, so, uh, that, that of course leads to a scene where Leia is, you know, being scolded and told to apologize by her mom, and when her mom leaves, she talks to Bale, kind of gives her some reassurance, and when, when that's all said and done, she sneaks out to the woods and is met slash abducted by a human Nikto and Zabrak mercenary who one of whom we saw watching them earlier so you know uh, Bale then immediately contacts Obi-Wan Obi-Wan is kind of shook because his hollow communicator was in a box and it hadn't beeped I assume for like 10 years so he's like what the fuck is happening when he's at home and so he when he talks to Bale, he basically just says, "Like, yeah, I'm not the same person I was ten years ago. Find somebody else." End the conversation. <clears throat> uh, and then another work day goes by. We find Nari strung up in the middle of Mos Eisley. I don't know if he's dead or not because the Inquisitor was very open to everyone in town how he wanted the Jedi alive but he still could be dead because mob justice we don't know he might come back up later again I hope he does <clears throat> excuse me and so I um, so after that Bale then shows up at Obi-Wan's home because he has this little sensor outside that tells him whether or not somebody's in there uh, and directly pleads with Obi-Wan to go find Leia, leading for him to retrieve Anakin and his own lightsaber from a just a random spot in the desert. And uh, the, then he uh, sets out on a little adventure. It's revealed that Rev was the one who com commissioned the mercs to go kidnap Leia to draw him out. So, yeah. That, that's mm, it's it's a little bit of a problem <laughs> and the episode ends with Obi-Wan getting on a transport to get off Tatooine it was a great foundation setter for the um, for the return to the early imperial period for returning to Obi-Wan just setting everything up it was great um, the motivations of the new antagonist are pretty laid out to bear any tension that's there is really there and it, it, you know I found, found my heart just skipping a beat every now and again uh, and Obi-Wan's disillusionment is heartbreaking as fuck <laughs> like I was like oh my god Obi-Wan no where is your hope man <laughs> um, but it was also very palpable and understand uh, understandable. So uh, yeah, it's great. I'm giving it an eight out of ten because uh, there it, it wasn't anything like the Mandalorian where it's it opens takes your breath away to try to establish it. It's it's really doing what it needs to do and doing it well and not pulling any punches while also not trying to uh I don't know be I don't want to say be innovative but you know it like if you come here it assumes that you need that you already know things and it, of course it makes sense <laughs> to to do that so it it's not great for setting up some of the situation in the Star Wars series but you shouldn't be watching it if that's what you want. Uh, so I gave it an 8 out of 10. <laughs> now, for episode 2, 
excuse me. Obi-Wan's transport lands on, uh, I don't know if this is the name of the planet or the name of the city. Um, I think it's the name of the planet because they didn't say anything else on a planet called Dayu where all signals are basically blocked going on or off planet. Uh, it, to me, it seems sort of like a smuggler slash crime world like Lord Mantell or anywhere in the uh, vast plane that is hot space. Uh, okay. And uh, while walking, Obi-Wan sees a clone veteran, a homeless clone, begging on the street for credits. Uh, he doesn't recognize him or anything. No, neither of them recognize each other. Um, but, you know, a little... A little paranoid, Obi-Wan just kind of stares at him for a little bit before handing him a couple of credits and continuing moving uh, by by the clone's armor markings. Because, yeah, he's still wearing his armor, uh, except for his helmet, which he's using to collect donations. It looks like he's 501st, so that that's something. I, he could come back up later. I don't know. I kind of hope he does. <laughs> It's uh, played by Tamora Morrison, of course. So that's great. Uh, so after the fact, he gets confronted by a spice dealer who's asking if he wants to buy some spice, use it, tries to prod some information out of her, basically tells her, like, dude, you're not going to find anybody here. J just sort of give up. I got kidnapped and brought here, too. Now I'm a spice dealer. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> uh, but after the fact... He finds a young boy who offers him to take him to a Jedi who helps people for a small price. Uh, and that Jedi is, I'm going to butcher his name, Kamel Nanjiani. I think I said that good enough. Uh, which, you know, that just means he's get, he's getting uh, <laughs> he's getting his money's worth out of getting so buff for Eternals. <laughs> like... Oh my god. Okay, so and and his character's name is Haja. Haja. Uh and he's introduced to us by get uh helping get a force sensitive boy and his mom off planet. Uh to escape to Corellia, of course, for for a price. But it's revealed he's a con artist, which it's like, aw, damn. <laughs> I kinda wanted him to be an actual Jedi. Even if he was shady, you know, I just I just wanted him to be an actual Jedi. Uh, um, and Obi Wan pretty much points that out fairly quickly, and then you know, pumps him for information of himself, his own. Uh, let's see, um, yeah, which leads Obi Wan to a spice lab, where uh, Ravis Mercs is are holding Leia. He almost gets captured, but he kicks ass like normal. And then gets Leia, Leia out of the sp of the spice den. And after they escape, Reva just puts out a whole alert to the entirety of the underworld like, "Hey, y'all y'all know that bounty we have for Je for outstanding Jedi? Yeah, Obi-Wan's here. Y'all might want to look for that." <laughs> And it's, like, like obviously, because she wants to capture, she wants to capture him for herself, for her own glory, for her own prestige, and she'll do basically anything to do it, even if it's getting on the nerves of the Grand Inquisitor and Fifth Brother. Uh, let's see. Leia, of course, as she does, gives some sass as they move through the streets. The Grand Inquisitor, who is also on planet, orders the ports locked down and a full Imperial garrison to be landed in the city. Uh, Leia sees the outstand outstanding bounty caused by Reva and Im like immediately distrusts him. And of course, why wouldn't she? She's a 10-year-old who doesn't know anything about Obi-Wan Kenobi, <laughs> and who, of course, is going by Ben and just runs off uh, while chasing her. Obi-Wan gets into a small firefight. He's a terrible shot, by the way. 
He's so bad. <laughs> He's such a bad shot. He, he can't fire a damn gun for his life. And it makes sense, but it but it, you would think that he would at least do a little bit of marksmanship training with it when he got it. Uh, <laughs> um, and that firefight alerts Riva to his location. Uh, she never, she doesn't catch up with them at that point. Uh, but uh, Leia's still running from Obi Wan, ends up falling off of her roof. Obi Wan catches her, restores the trust, all that goodness. Um, but Riva, or Reva, Riva, I'm not entirely sure, um, ends up, you know, losing their trail, finding Haja, who can, who offered to help Obi-Wan get off the planet, and she siphons information out of him. He do, She doesn't kill him, so he might come back. I hope he does. He was, He's always good. Camille Nanjiani's always good to see. He's so funny. Um, and then she uh, goes to hunt, hunt them again. Uh, it, it, at, a, at a cargo ship port, which I think is almost entirely self-automated, so no, no civilians or anything. Um, at, at Reva catches up, searches for Obi-Wan as he's hiding with Leia on the ship, and that is when, in taunting him, Reva reveals that Anakin, Darth Vader, is still very much alive and would be very happy if Obi-Wan was brought to him, even, even though, you know, Vader has not been seen or heard of, heard from in this in these two episodes at all, which it just it just further shows Reva's ambitions. But it also it also shakes Obi Wan a little bit because he he was like comforted by the thought that Anakin was probably dead, and now he knows he's not, and it's troubling for him because he do, he like e even when he is able to run into the ship and get away, he doesn't say anything for the rest of the episode, which is only at like a minute or two, except for Anakin's name. It it, sh it shakes him to his core. And so we we know that... We know that uh, Vader is probably going to show up more in, in the rest of the series because Hayden Christensen's back and he's in the suit. And speaking of Hayden Christensen and Vader, uh, the last shot of the episode is Vader and his back to tank. I think it's in his Mustafar fortress, but it could be at the uh, the uh, fortress Inquisitorius. I don't know. It doesn't really pan out that much. It's just him in a back to tank. But it it, it he's coming. <laughs> he's a coming. <laughs> and I'm so excited for it. Oh my god. Uh, so the action intention was. In my opinion, very well done. Even though Obi Wan's a to uh, total uh, terrible shot, he's he's so bad. Like I'm not gonna harp on it anymore, but he's so bad he doesn't kill anyone. And I don't think it's because he's trying not to. I think it's just because he's a bad shot. <laughs> um, and and he's also got split attention during that scene, so it's like okay. <laughs> um. Uh, the motivations for both Riva and Leia are fleshed out some more, and to a good degree. So it, it and none of it feels forced either. The little confrontation between Leia and Obi Wan doesn't feel forced, and I know sometimes that can happen with kid actors, but excuse me, it feels pretty good. So I'm gonna give this an eight out of ten as well. With both episodes being a very strong opening for the series. Honestly, it could be just like one giant episode because it, it leads right into the other and it flows very well, but I understand why they split it. Doesn't matter. It's good and it's got me hyped for the rest of the series. So overall, 8 out of 10 for both. Um, I thank you so very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen, Citizen of the Empire. If you enjoyed, like, comment, subscribe, all that. Help me out. And stay tuned for more Kenobi reviews.